We're going to begin with a land acknowledgement from our um, good new friend, Payman, in New Zealand. Payman. Uh, apologies, Sam. By land acknowledgement, you mean just a brief introduction? Is that? Yeah, and actually, I, I appreciate the opportunity to offer another reminder to everybody yeah, that, yeah, yeah. that the, the, the idea, so we are truly a global band. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And all of us as a global band um, has the opportunity and the responsibility to better understand the layers of stories of the land and the people from which we like are perched at this moment. So part of our hope is that each week, a different person can both help us better understand where in the world they are and maybe help us better understand some of the larger story of their place. And so actually I'm gonna put in the chat for anybody that wants to think about doing this the next time, a really good set of resources for better understanding how it works can be right there. Now, knowing that I basically asked you if you would do this like 45 seconds ago, Payman, when you hear yeah. that, does that still sound like the kind of thing that you'd like to do? Or am I basically just like tossing you over the gangplank of Shackleton's sunk ship? No, no, not a problem, Sam. Give it a... Great. Okay, uh, uh, Tana Koto, everybody. Uh, um, what Sam is referring to, I think, uh, what the indigenous Maori called a, a mihi in New Zealand, which is a, a, a geography, a geographical introduction of a person through landscapes. Uh, my name is Paymon. Um, uh, my last name uh, is, is uh, hard to pronounce, but it means b uh, pilgrim. Um, I'm originally mm. from uh, mountainous terrains in Iran. And I've lived in um, Greece. I lived in Canada for 16 years in British Columbia. And 23 years ago, I moved to New Zealand, uh, to the South Island of New Zealand. And I'm in a place called uh, Kokorarata in Maori uh, or Port Levy in English. Uh, I'm a professor of environmental sciences in the University of Canterbury. And um, I'm uh, interested in climate change and environment change. Uh, my, my interest in being with this group is that um, I'm looking for other ways of um, knowing and understanding the world and particularly using those philosophies in my teaching, uh, which I've been rather unhappy with for the last decade or so. Uh, but uh, anyways, that is me. Kia ora. Thank you, Payman. Uh, as you all know, we always like to start with music, and tonight we are blessed with the opportunity to have the lovely Bobby McDonald do just that. Okay, hey, thank you. I really loved your land acknowledgement, Heyman, and I, I loved how it kind of brought us, like oriented us with your journey to the very last line when you said, that is me. <laughs> I really love that. And I think the, um, the song I want to do for you right now is a song, the first song I ever wrote. And uh, I was 10. It was, you know, 1976. And I learned how to play three chords for my sister and then went out in the front steps to write a song. And um, I wanted to say that I was singing out to the world. And it, People think sometimes I was thinking of like someone I was in love with, but at that time I was in love with the world and in a relationship with it. And this is the song I sang, you know, out to the Chicago little street that I lived on. Forget about your troubles and come with me. Forget about the mess for a minute, please. Forget about the prices of gasoline. 
come with me. Live the life you choose, but come with me. We don't need any rules, no, come with me. I love you, dear, I know we know. We cannot hide our feelings, they're just like snow. We gotta come down. Gotta come down and show themselves. Come with me. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks, Bobby. Bobby. Thank you. And Bobby, I know that you just um, said something about this on the Seed and Spark Network. And if anybody doesn't know what I mean by that, I'm going to drop a link in the chat. But do you just want to say out loud what you recently posted there before we move on? I don't Meaning know. a search for musicians. <laughs> oh. Thank you. I was really somewhere else. Um, oh, you know, we would love it if any of you are musicians or you have uh, someone in your life who's a musician or you know of someone that would like to come and share a song. Um, you can share my email with them or connect through Sam, but we just love to have people share, you know, if you play piano or um, poetry is welcome too. We just want to give folks the idea the space to express themselves in many ways so yep so if that's interesting to you find bobby and we look forward to hearing your art on a future night um but that's a future night tonight is the night when the woman in the burnt orange hat breaks it down for us so carol sanford has been at this work for four decades and she's um <laughs> she has in the past lives done everything from stand-up comedy to uh singing herself she is the author of five books as of right now but in two weeks it will be six and to get a window into the type of work that she does uh her book that comes out in two weeks is called Indirect Work, Regenerative Change Theory for Businesses, Communities, Institutions, and Humans. If we were going to have heard her personal story, part of it would probably involve what it's like to have a Mohawk grandfather and a Klansman as a father. But tonight, we get to learn alongside her to better make sense of how our worldview directly shapes each of our individual abilities to change that world. So Carol, welcome. We are so excited to have you with us. And Carol, you are on mute, so you need to unmute yourself. There we go. I love the music, Bobby. Thank you. Thank um, you. I have uh, members in communities who enrich my life and create a, a space in which to discover. And a significant number of them, them come out of what I call the Deep Pacific, because I don't like the other acronyms that are often thrown out. And uh, so it, it feels wonderful to hear the Kaora 
grieving and to feel like uh, with Peyton's story about his place of being there, I, I'm called to remember the place that I'm in. I now live in a forest uh, adjacent to a, a natural wildlife corridor where I can't see the bears, but I know on the outside of the trees, they're moving along at various times. And when I look out my window, what I see are no concrete and no people except rarely. Uh, and the uh, native peoples that have lived here for generations and a large number of them I was on a call with today and not, I was a listener telling the stories of the discoveries and the understanding of this place is about highs and lows. There are deep uh, uh, caverns into the water and high mountains. And everywhere you look, there are these extremes that represent the ability to understand the whole. So I thought I would share that story that they were telling today because it really stuck with me. Um, I would disagree with one thing that Sam said. I'm not going to break anything down. That is a Western paradigm about fragmentation. And we're going to do the opposite, Sam. OK? Uh, and the other thing is I noticed, Mark, I appreciate your comment in the chat. But I'm not going to answer any questions. And let me tell you why. Um, I believe that the most important work we have to do, literally the nodal work to do to overcome the warring that we do, the racism that we do, the uh, uh, gerrymandering, anything we do that fragments and splits and competes, the most important thing we have to do, and this is going to sound strange, is to build the capacity for people to trust their own reflected, lived, experience. And that's a very different theory than how we try and educate and give change and openings to people right now. We try and get experts and thought leaders and science and something else that has now for the last, and book number seven will be about this. Uh, and what we've been doing is teaching people to not trust their own experience. Now, I have to admit nowadays, I don't want a lot of people trusting their experience because what they think it means is what everything that's happened to me all up until now, I ought to trust it. I, I put a very important word in there. It's called reflected. And for me, reflection means putting a framework in mind that disrupts the models I'm thinking through and the worldviews I hold which are preventing me from actually even seeing what my lived experience is telling me. The reason I think this is the most notable thing to work on right now is if we don't teach children and then go back and teach adults who never got it, which I spend a lot of time doing, uh, then what they do is become susceptible to borrowed, unexamined ideas because they don't trust themselves, they find others. So. I probably 20 years ago quit being happy with people introducing me as an expert. Sam did not, thank you very much. Because I'm not an expert on anything, nor do I want to be. I don't want to be a guru. I don't want to be, I want to be a thinking person who stimulates, disrupts, and is a positive contrarian. So we overcome the certainties that we have. So today, forgive me, but I will answer no questions. Um, and we will do hopefully a little work in a breakout group, but I'm gonna offer you some ideas that I, I work with. And the breakout group would be to give you a way to play with them, reflect on them, see what they do for your work. So I'd like to, if you will uh, allow me to share with you, um, I've got like six slides and they have a lot on them, but I'm happy to share these. The way you get my slides are you send me an email. I don't give them to Sam and he gives them to everybody. You have to tell me you want them and you have to tell me why and what you want to do with them. And so 
I'm going to share these with you or welcome to take screenshots if, if it's worthy, worth it, uh, feels useful to you. If not, you certainly can get these. And by the way, here's the book that, isn't that a pretty cover? I'm so excited about that cover. Um, anyway, at the end, I also will share with you uh, a gift I'd like to give everyone who's here. I'm inviting people to buy this book and to read it and reflect. It's got interwoven in it, a workbook. So I ask you as you read this book, not to believe it, not to accept, not to underline, not to adopt, not to take it away and pick a few things and put in what you do, but to use it on yourself because you can't go use it in a business and organization of any kind until you've used it on yourself. So there's something embedded in there, which are called intermezzo. If you've ever been to the, the opera or symphony, there are little intermezzos where there may be breaks in time and people uh, may listen to another set of music, which is an aspect of it blown into a larger picture or the backstory. They're the things that help us make sense of what's going on. These in my book are exercises. So you get a combined book and a workbook. And if you buy even one copy of this and you send me the receipt and you add to it, I heard you on Seed and Spark or Plus Spark, I will take the bonus. And in fact, if you'll go to this website, carolsanford.com, it'll tell you what the bonuses are that I'm giving people. And it's a purely marketing thing. I want this work out in the world. So I'm giving people phone calls for a couple of hours, uh, assessment forms, meetings, book clubs. If you, anything you buy, I'm going to give you the next level up for free. If you tell me that what we talked about tonight was useful to you, and I know where you came from, you may not share that offer with anyone else. They can go to that page. But uh, anyway, I think we've got enough of the upfront here. Uh, I want to talk to you about worldviews and paradigms and how they affect not only what you can contribute in the world, but whether we can even uh, um, have a role in making a world that works. I personally believe right now that we're addicted to and uh, attached to our ways of making a living, our egos, our careers, and all the practices that we borrowed from somewhere, usually unexamined, and we can't see that they're not doing what we need. They can't see that the energy we put in is actually escalating the very things all of our practices were designed to work on. So my work right now feels like it's about helping us reconceive and question how it is we think change works in the world and be willing to let go of everything we're currently doing. Um, so tonight I want to share a bit about how I get to this crazy idea so that maybe uh, we can evolve the difference we make and make it toward what really matters. Um, let me see if I, there we go. So I like to always run workshops while I'm talking. Because in other words, I, you just got my nonsense and that's all you got. Here, I want your nonsense added and for you to create like three columns. And I'm terrible at spelling. I see one of them. I'm not good at details. I can see big dynamics and things moving, but I keep people around me who can manage the details so they don't fall in the cracks. So sorry for the, the typos I already see. Um, I would like for you to keep notes. As you're listening, I don't, don't write down what I say. There, it's recorded. It's you know you can look at it right later. Write down what it's evoking in you. So if you hear something, say, "Here was the subject I heard," and I believe that it's related to something I'm currently working on. So I want to think about this a little more. You write a proposal to yourself or to how you'd like to introduce it. So the first one was, I think. I think it may be related to something I want to think about right now. Maybe it also could be something that you feel like could change how you're contributing. You go, wow, all right, I just put that to work in my head and I think it could affect 
something I want to contribute to in a bigger way, not just my current work. And then the third column will be what we'll call your curious curiosity column, where you think, I'm, I'm very interested in that, but I don't get it. But I feel like there's something there, and I want to educate myself on it more. So this is a way of giving you an opportunity to record where you're being disrupted. Uh, and if I, sorry, I see this admit, and I go up and admit people, Sam, that's your, that's your job. But <laughs> that's right. You don't need to worry about that at all, Carol. I can't, I can't not do it. I'm don't so sweat it. Don't sweat letting it. People in. Okay. All right. So now you know what your assignment is. Well, you have one other one. You're going to select a program, a practice, or a process that you currently do. So in uh, payments case, it could be uh, a lecture in with a group of students or a critique of a doctoral student in their dissertation. And for Bobby, it could be songwriting uh, and that whole process. Uh, Sam, yours could have to do with your puppy <laughs> or your kids. So you pick something in life the, because we need you to have a lived experience that you're using to reflect on and see whether what I'm talking about is useful. All right. so. We're going to start with looking at paradigms. Or we're going to we're going to look at the paradigm side. So, the other blessing I had in my life, besides having a father who is a Ku Klux Klan, which I learned enormous about, uh, learned a lot from, uh, not all of which was useful, and a grandfather which had lived. We've got a lot of feedback. Can somebody tell me what's happening? I'm hearing. Yeah, we can do volume. Okay, let's just wait for. Should be all set. Sorry. Yeah, just had to okay. mute somebody, Carol. Sorry. Okay, that's all right. Uh, I just felt like I was getting a little lost. Um, in uh, the mid 1960s, I was a, an undergraduate at UC Berkeley. Uh, and there was a man came to speak there as a graduate lecturer for almost two years named Thomas Kuhn. He wrote a book called The Structure of the Scientific Revolution. So I got to sit as a, uh, a non, I wouldn't take it for credit. I just got to, uh, what do they call that? Audit. I got to audit the class and he had just published his book. It was an amazing thing to be told, having grown up thinking I knew the truth, I had gotten the truth, I was done, I was, uh, what, 19, 20 years old. And he said to all of us, but the world moves about what we know is truth. And it comes from changing what we can see. And, you know, we listened to that for a few weeks and I remember, remember me asking him and everybody else saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is, how do you do that? How do you help people shift paradigms? You know what he said to us? I don't know yet. I can just see that that's what's happening. And it's your job and, and mine too, but to go to the next level of understanding how. So I've spent pretty close to 50 years now trying to understand how you help people see and evolve and move their paradigm. And this is one little aspect of the work that I do around that. And you, if you think from this way, you'll see it in all of my books and all my Medium articles my podcast, and I'm starting a YouTube channel uh, in two weeks also. Uh, so first, we were asked to read a whole lot of Einstein's um, lecture notes at that point. Uh, you know, Einstein was teaching also, and you've all seen a variety of, one of the varieties of the published 37 caveats, which are, we can't find the new territory with an old map. You know, we can't use the old mind that got us where we were to try and get to somewhere new. He says that in 37 different ways. So I kept thinking, well, what does that mean? Because uh, I hear people saying it all the time, and it looks to me like they're doing the same thing and adding on a little. Well, I researched to find what he said, and I found this amazing set of metaphors that he used to explain it. One was, he said, the old map the old process we use, the old mapping that we use in our mind is based on a billiard ball metaphor. 
And uh, it comes from our Newtonian understanding, you know, the, the previous physics, that is really about being in charge of how things happen and who it happens to and who's in charge. So the story he used was, all right, if you're in a billiard ball metaphor, you're looking at a billiard table and you decide what pockets people ought to be in, whether that's good for them or good for you or good for the environment or good for whatever you believe in, you're defining what people should go for. And then you're picking the people who are not going toward that. They're the cue balls on the, toward the pockets and you're the cue stick. And if you think you can define for others, including Earth, what the pocket ought to be, who ought to go there, and the cue stick about how you're going to move them, you are in the old map. So if you have anything in any of your plans, I would say to you, that defines ideals or end states or goals or visions or missions or any of that, Billy uh, Einstein would say, get off the pool table. And what he would then do is to do a bit of helping people connect to the quantum matrix. Uh, and he talked about, well, and David Bohm did a lot also, of talking about the difference between direct and indirect work, because in the quantum model, what you get is even observing something affects it. It affects its movement. It doesn't have to be touched with your cue stick. It affects its trajectory and the destination. And you cannot measure where it's going. You can have all the goals you want. You can have all the metrics you want. And none of them have anything to do with how the world really works. And the other thing that quantum theory says is everything is a system and it has its own destiny, its own path and the system it's in does. And no matter how much we would like to affect it, all we can do is derail it. And I developed from what my grandfather, well, I shouldn't blame him because they're my interpretations of the seven principles he gave me, which came from his, well, came through the Iroquois into the Mohawk community and his grandfather and great grandfather. Uh, and so that's what I'm gonna share a little of you, a little bit of with you. And I'm gonna do, well, I'm going to one thing first, it appears. Uh, I'm going to talk about the four paradigms and the difference between direct and indirect in the paradigms we're living with. So the first one is we tend to have a very strong extract value paradigm. And all of us have it. There are some we would rather blame and say they're much worse. But in some ways, we all are. And we, we have to have a value exchange. But when it's all about us, we end up doing a lot of damage to people, to planet, to social system. And that riles up a bunch of people. It has for quite a few years, uh, 50 years that I've been alive, I've watched this grow. And then people say, we have to stop that. I call that the arrest disorder paradigm. And it's all about stopping the extraction, whether it's mining or uh, some kind of financial thing or anything that is doing harm. We work to repair, uh, to protect, to waste less and to reduce harm. Now, we all know this one and we mostly end up working from that unless you're strongly, strongly and daily and immersed in an ongoing and non-colonized view of life through an indigenous process, through a uh, lineage teaching process or potentially in some work of quantum thinking, most of the practices we have are about reducing harm. Less of this, less of that. Most of the companies, all their sustainability, circular well-being, you look at all of them and this is what they're about. Now, you can't really blame them because the extract value is wearing us out here. So what we want to uh, notice is there was a reaction to that and that started in mostly in the 60s with Virginia Satir, Abraham uh, Maslow, Carl Rogers, uh, a bunch of folks who said, we can't do just arrest a disorder. We have to do good. We should go out and help people actualize. 
uh, they are able to be self-directed. Now, the problem is who defines good? Because this is philanthropy where we go into cultures and destroy them in order to bring our good, our Christian values, or our um, philanthropic values, our big foundation, which can cure some disease and give people food, even though it's not food they eat. It's all three of these are about really projecting some kind of ideals. So Einstein is trying to get us to see that these are all billiard ball processes. They're all us thinking we know the answer for others and we can put ourselves to work uh, to work on that. So we're now gonna look at the top one. Oops, it did. I thought I had it dancing around. Well, too bad, that didn't work. So uh, what we wanna look at is, is so I said this, these lower ones are more about, well, direct work means you've got the cue stick and you personally think you hit it or you influence it or you incentivize it or you punish it, something that moves toward the pockets. All of that's direct, where the indirect is really about, and the new book that will be out in two weeks identifies three arenas, capability, culture, and consciousness. And that those are all indirect. They create a membrane. They create a womb. They create a matrix in which regeneration can happen. And regeneration is about instead of doing for others or to them or with them or against them, we evolve their capacity to be self-determining, to do what they are on their way to. And their own essence determines it. And so we're working with a system created so that each um, entity in each whole can move in a nested way toward what it sees as its actualization. So I'm gonna pause for a moment. And I'd like for you to just make a few more notes to yourself about what is, and, and try not to evaluate me because that'll get you in a trap. Try and do reflection on your own work and your own lived experience about where you see some of this fits in one of your three columns. It seems relevant right now, or it seems like something to go back and put to work. And then it seems like things you'd like to learn something about because it feels right, but you don't know what it means. So think about that for just a moment. And then if you would, put a few notes in the chat room of, about... Um, What's going on in your own thinking, your own discovery? And I'm going to be quiet for just a second and let you do that. Uh, and then I'm going to decide how much more I can do of what I got for. I put you in breakouts for five or 10 minutes to talk to each other. So do your own thinking recording for a moment. And I'll open the chat room, which I forget to look at and see what, uh, what's happening for you. Actually, I see someone wrote here to help overcome the uncertainties. No, it's help overcome the certainties we have. Uncertainties are fine. It's the certainties and the attachment. So uh, that may not be right, but it's what I said. So I didn't notice no people were going to take notes on what I was saying. It's not very useful to take notes on what I say. I assure you, it's more useful to take notes on what you're thinking, and what's moving for you. It looks like I'll have a practice of doing that. Well, all right. I'm not seeing new ideas added yet. I'd love to see uh, what you're discovering about yourself.
Okay. All right. Well, I will keep moving and I'm going to give you a little bit of what I got from my grandfather. Oh, there you go. See, I we got this little dancing thing that what's amazing to me is what a big break there is from the top three driving paradigms right now and the one we have to move to and how much more difference we can make. Uh, by the way, my books are full. I'm not doing many stories tonight, but I've got over 100 stories spread between my five books or six books uh, of people and how this works in their life and their business. All right, let's try a little bit of the seven first principles that come from uh, comparing classical physics and quantum physics. In the middle, I put a lot of the humanist movement ideas because the do good comes out of the humanists who were trying to overcome the behavioralists, which is the real disaster. Uh, but boy, it's not another story for another day. And it's the point of my seventh book about John Watson set out uh, to destroy our belief in ourselves and gave us behavioralism, which is something that's undermining. And I easily, you can hear, I'll go off on a tangent and whoop, we'll never get back. So let me get back over here. All right. The real challenge, David Bohm, who was not only Einstein's student, but his teacher. Einstein said that he became one of the best teachers he had. So. I go read Bohm's work also, and I had a, a few of his students for when he was a doctoral student at Berkeley. I had a few of his students who were my TAs. So I got to have, I was, oh my gosh, I had such an amazing life getting to touch these things that, uh, well, they made a big difference. The major th uh, first, the one that throws us completely off is how we think science works. And that started with the positivists. It moved into modern uh, uh, scientific method, it's called, and where it always divided everything from mind and body were divided. And we had to create trees, which were not trees, but they were limbs and leaves and roots and trunks and frogs that had to be chopped up into pieces. and even gender is, you know, I don't know if you fill out forms anymore, but I go fill out forms and they ask me my gender and they start out with three or four and then say, and add more if you want it. So we couldn't fragment anymore. And for almost a race, we do the same thing. Uh, so fragmenting becomes reductionist in that it moves away from a whole. If you think about, it, if any of you have children, or were children, <laughs> that'll work too. You will notice that when we try and look at a child and fragment them into subjects or abilities or behaviors, what we're doing is losing the whole of the child. Not the wholeness, not the holism, but the whole, being able to see it as a whole. And being able to look at a life shed instead of a watershed. Can you hear that difference? And we end up calling something a watershed, which is a fragment of something I call a life shed or an air shed or a food shed, all divided on what it does for us. How do we overcome fragmentation? Well, if you stay in the left side in the Newtonian paradigm, you try and figure out some categories and then you define some genericness for what fits in that box. And then you find out how everything is, uh, fits in one of those boxes or else there's something wrong with it and it's broken. So we get tons of problem solving because we all started with fragmenting. The only way that you can actually understand the whole uh, and it's see it in a value adding process. So if your child is at school and you're being told they have a problem with this college or grandchildren, as I noticed you, a lot of you got gray hair like me, you know that what you've got are non-holes because you can't see them creating and contributing or trying to coming to the table and say, can I set the table and decorate the table? If we now look at them as, well, they don't have the capability with their fragment. If we look at their intention and their contribution, and you do the same thing with uh, 
every human being, they look like they're causing a problem, but what are they trying to create? What are they trying to contribute? And then we watch them to understand their essence. And unfortunately, that's not teachable in a short period of time. Again, if you grew up in some cultures, you learn to do it at a very, very young age. And to see the working of that which is, that if it were removed, I wouldn't be me. So my, uh, and naming essence is a little bit of a foolhardy thing, but it gives you something to hang on to, to remember. Uh, I mean, people often say I'm very disagreeable. Well, what I am is my essence is actually about disrupting certainty so that you have a chance to break anything you're really still connected to deeply and have an examine and create a new space. But I'm a positive contrarian on the way to doing that. Uh, and I do it in order to improve discernment. So those paradigms, these things I'm doing, all they're about is discernment. So it is, uh, so it's my core process. It's essence, not purpose. So somebody wrote purpose is to interrupt certainty. Nope. I'm not a big fan of the humans having purpose or individuals. I believe that is misleading. It makes us sound like we're separate from. I, I never look at the chat room. That's bizarre. So we tend to create purposes, missions, visions. All those are anthropocentric. Me being born, I came in like with an essence, and it has work to do. And so I'm sharing with you what my work to do is, and not my purpose, but my work, which means how I can create uh, support and carry out what I uniquely can bring. All right, so we got a little in essence there. And I, I have a couple of communities, one of business groups and one of change agents. And we do a lot of work there, uh, uh, learning how it is we understand and get past all these purpose and anthropocentric things back to our essence. All right. So stay on the left for a minute. If we fragment it, we have to create categories and make generic things that fit in them. And now the minute they don't fit, we have an issue or a problem. And then we have an ideal because we're billiard ball, right? On the left side. But if on the other hand, we can look at a whole, a whole valley or a whole child or a, a whole community, and we can see what its essence is, what its story is, what its work is to do, in a, a larger context, now we can understand its specific essence. And in my fifth book, The Regenerative Life, I tell a lot of stories about my grandfather uh, who raised pigs and who also was a county advisor on farming, walked around with me and helped me learn to see the essence of each pig and a pigness and what its role was in the establishment of a farm. And of course, um, they were all investigated, but so we go talk a bit about what it means to be a wild pig. All of that was to improve my discernment um, and overcome the fragmentation, the categorization, and therefore the problems I created. Now we're going to do the fourth one, and then we're going to let you go into breakout group for a while and play with this. So. The fourth uh, aspect, and by the, way, th by the way, these are not a list, they're a, a heptad, a seven turn system that the upper ones all are inner work and the uh, lower three are outer work we need to do in the world. And this fourth one is the bridge. It is overcoming our ontology about how humans come into the world. So they come in fixed, predetermined, IQ is fixed or it's hereditary or it's their DNA, something that has no idea beyond that they are what they are and always will be. Now, Carol Dweck introduced the idea of growth, which is a slight step above because it meant, well, people can learn, they can learn new skills, you can give them opportunity, but it doesn't understand that we're all born really incomplete beings. We, I mean, we know physically we have to learn a lot of stuff, but we somehow think that what's inside is what's always there, rather than you can develop a being. I mean, I look at how, 
I'm embarrassed when I think about me as a teenager, terribly embarrassed uh, because, well, I didn't have a community to help me in the way I probably should have. But as I got older, I began to see not only was I getting smarter, I could see things and understand things, but I was becoming more whole as a person. Uh, and that process is about the development of our will, our motivation, our being, our function, but who we are and what we can see possible in the world. So I would love to have you have 10 minutes uh, and then we'll come back and do a little reflecting and let Sam give us a closing. But Sam, could you create some groups that had two or three, no more than that people? And the question is to share what you are seeing relative to the practice you were thinking about, the uh, program approach, whatever you were questioning, share that with each other. Uh, and uh, I'll tell you more about development. I'll try to when we come back. It's not anything about flourishing. It's about evolving who we are as beings. Uh, and well, I, you can't do everything in one hour, Carol. It's okay. Put people in breakout groups, please, and let them share what they're learning for themselves. Try not to comment on whether you agree or disagree. It's irrelevant. I'm going away shortly. Don't argue with me, even in your head. Work on yourself and have fun. And we'll be back in 10 minutes. Hey, it looks like we, we've got Darcy so hanging out. Yep. Some folks might be listening in, in the middle of dinner or something else. Well, true. And now she's oh. <laughs> now she jumped in. Yeah. Do you want to go join the group? I'm going to hang out here in case somebody joins the meeting or has problems in their breakout room, but you can join. You, I, I put you in room. No, two. I don't, I don't want to. Don't if want people to start talking to me, then they're not talking to themselves. So wrong epistemology goes to work. Gotcha. Um, no problem. I'm also happy to take over and put people in groups as they pop out. I'm very good at managing it. <laughs> if you want to go, but it's up to you. I'm, I'm, I think if I open, I think I'd have to make you the host. And I think if I make you the host, yeah. it'll kill these breakout rooms. I think they'll, they'll, I should have done I it. I think you're that. right. I think you're right. Yeah. All right. I'll leave you alone. No, no problem. This is great. It's really interesting. Good. It's an interesting for your life. It is. Well, I think the thing that I'm interested in, um, I understand, like, uh, I do a lot of work around that involves, um, like, design thinking protocols, particularly in education. Uh -oh. And uh, I know. I write against design thinking everywhere. I, Go like. Yeah, I, well, I'm, I'm, I'm realizing why you must. And, and I was just yeah. thinking, like, part of that is so much about, I'm realizing so much of it is about starting with a whole and then fragmenting it and then trying to solve fragments of problems right. in the hopes that you'll eventually get back to the whole but i right so it's, it's you've really, already killed it <laughs> totally right i so it's so interesting i'm now thinking like ah what are the other ways to get started then that might also use so i on medium i have written i don't know three or four articles and i have a podcast or two on design thinking okay uh on other ways to go about it so my I'm podcast business second opinion where I critique Harvard Business Review one article at a time and give an alternative. <laughs> and one you. of the things I critique is design thinking. Yep. And where this is on your on your website Me, or on no on Medium. On Medium, okay. You know, Medium. So just search for my name. I also publish a magazine there. So the people who are in my communities submit things uh, from their website and I publish some of their work also. Oh, that's but perfect. I think the best work I've done on design thinking is in uh, Business Second Opinion podcast. And there are show notes 
later we started doing almost transcripts, but I don't know whether I've forgotten how far back. But it's on every place you can find a podcast. And I would just also search for your name there too. Uh, no, search for business second opinion. Business second opinion. Okay. Oh, and that's then, great. Let, let me, me look that up now because I'll think. share that with the whole group. I'm going to okay. pull that up. But go right. ahead, keep talking. While I, I was going to say, let me know what you think. Yeah, I'm so interested. Yeah. Oh, you will be. You'll go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's crazy. It'll, it'll stir you up. Good. Oh, here we go. Podcasts. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is good. I'll um. I will. I'll share this link when everybody's back. They won't see it if I put it in now. No. So what? But I mean, we have. Do you have? A, can I pick your brain for a minute or no? Well, we'll see. Yeah. Try. I don't. <laughs> um, I don't answer questions. Remember. Oh right. Well, help me think together then, out loud. Like, so my round rule is: if you have a question, you can tell me the question, but you have to tell me your own best answer. Um. So what I, the my my question would have been if not the if the the at the, at its core design thinking is about breaking down is often an assumption that the problem that people are trying to solve is often not the problem and so right. it's about getting to the core and of the problem and usually that involves i believe fragmentation it's certainly reductionist so here's a question for you that might help of my four paradigm extract value arrest disorder do good and regeneration where does problem solving come uh that's a good question uh maybe maybe yeah it, does, it doesn't sit nicely in there but my biggest problem was like where do you start if you instead of if how do you start with a hole like how do you even start to approach something if you're right. looking at the hole and one of the things that seed and spark does which is the book that we used as a starting point for this expedition is it breaks the hole down into what I think of as sort of like mini holes. So for instance, like the first chapter of Seed and Spark is about identity, which is in and of itself, its own kind of hole. Um, it's not, it's, which I think that's different. Uh, so well, it depends on how you do it. I, most people do identity in a fragmented way or like a, a, a set of um, top, a typology. Mm-hmm. You can be uh, on the Enneagram or a Myers Briggs. That's how they do identity. I'm just going to quick broadcast a time for folks to, so in case they're, yeah, they in case got someone's some occupying most of the time. Right, three or four minutes left. Yeah. Yeah, four minutes. That's good. So, identity, what were the others? Because I think identity is rarely done in a non-fragmenting way. It's a, yeah, it's a good, yeah. I think that's probably, I think I can understand where that would be true. Um, hold on a second. I gave you a hint on how you get to Holt. Give me the hint again then. <laughs> you see it at work in a value adding process to which it's contributing for its own actualization. Mm, okay. All right. So, so me, if you watch me working here, which you are, and you see, I'm trying to contribute. I'm trying to be in a value adding process that transforms your certainty and has you want to ask these questions of not necessarily me, but that's where it starts. If I'm watching, you, Mo, you're watching me at work. You're watching me as a whole because every aspect of me, my will, my being, my function, all is at work because I'm in a cont contribution mode, not in a static thing you're going to divide up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I see that. I understand that. Now, the challenge is doing it because we are so conditioned to fragment. Uh, and we think we can make a list of categories, uh, types, some kind of generic that'll fit everybody. And the minute we do, even if we don't fragment on the first step, we fragment on the second one. 
Right. Well, so you asked about the, the, the book. So the way the book is organized, um, it's saying that nature operates using seven design principles. And the principles are identity, information, relationships, emergence, patterns, processes, and structures. So that's someone trying to do what I did without working at the level of living systems. They instead went to nature. Mm -hmm. And first, that's not how nature works. Those seven are how humans interpret and apply nature to themselves, like mm -hmm. relationship. You see in the middle of my top one here? Yeah. It's a hu humanistic idea about we're related, but that makes us separate. If we're related, well, if you and I are related and connected, we're not with us, we're, we're not in a one being with anything. I got you. We're, look, okay. we're taking a fragment and trying to put it together. We're taking, because hmm. uh, relating and connecting is the idea of putting back together something which didn't hold. Right. Yeah. That's okay. That's really interesting. That's that I hadn't ever seen it that way. And of course, we can't see. I get I listen to people's language, and I can see the image they're holding. We probably ought to bring people back, right? We're past. No, we're not. Um, we're still there. I, I have a timer on it. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna broadcast. I'm gonna close the rooms, and that gives people one more minute. Yeah. Right. And then what I'm gonna ba basically do is ask people to share what became less certain for them tonight and tell me that either in the chat or out loud and then I'll hand it back to you and Sam and you can share whatever I you know you already you said you wanted to share something I'm just oh, going to share I want to share the link to your um I want right. to share the link to your podcasts great this is really fantastic I'm so glad you joined us tonight me too I'm having a lot of fun. Good. I think that I, I, I think people were like in thought when you were asking us to respond in the chat because as soon as you moved on, there's like eight or nine things that immediately popped oh, into okay. the chat. So you, if you go you back will and look send, at well, and would you please send me the chat? Because I will. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'll get it. I we usually and we'll also post the video on our on our um, on our site, and I'll I'll share that with you also. Okay. Do you want to keep yeah. sharing when people come back or do you want to stop sharing your screen? Oh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm not. Sorry. I okay. had, I'm going to put up one last, but I'm not going to talk about it. Okay. Uh, I want to do this thing. I'm too Whoops. It looks like everybody's back, Carol. Okay, so um, I'm going to ask you to share with me in a moment about um, s something that you feel like you're carrying your way to disrupt yourself. But I want to remind you that if you go to my website, you can look at all the stuff that if you want to talk to me some more, there's many opportunities. And anyone who tells me they were at th this conversation I will go from the one book bonus to the two if you buy one book. And if you buy five books, I'll go to the 10 book bonus. So you get more than what you would normally get if you tell me you were here. I would love to, and I'm gonna now stop sharing my screen. And I would love to have you, if you would, share with me in a combination of the chat room, but. I love, I need to feel your energy where you are now. So I need to have a few people talk back to me about how you're disrupting yourself. Uh, I don't need for you to tell me anything about me or what I said. I'm going to be gone uh, as shortly. So that didn't matter. What stays with you is what's happening for you. Could a few people talk to me about that? Wow, where to begin? I'll 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 jump in. Um, Thanks, Sedona. Yeah, no, and this is just kind of a an ongoing conversation. We felt very unfinished, but 
um, feeling very resonant, very at home with having parts of ourselves broken open and just wanting to embrace the journey that we're on, that we'll always be on and to, um, and to learn. And where we ended up was some conversation about wanting to see the world and, and our own experiences through multiple lenses and recognizing that we can only be in our own lived experience, but to be more open to just wanting to see things more broadly. Um, I'm saying something maybe beyond what we what we talked about there, but it was just a process okay. that we just beginning to engage in, and it just felt um, just very at home to be um, to letting some things in that feels more whole, um, and to be more true to more true to who we are in the moment, Lovely. and being open to whatever might come from that. Yeah, something along those lines. Others mm -hmm. that might have been with me would might perhaps can express some things differently. Or have a different way of saying it, right. That, yeah, okay. exactly, yeah. A, few, a couple more reflections, if you would. How you're disrupting your thinking from our time together. Mm -hmm. I had the benefit of being in a room alone with Carol, and uh, I was sharing with her that I do a lot of work with um, processes that involve design thinking. And she's like, oh, yeah, I write against design thinking all the time. So I'm very anxious to go. I threw, uh, I threw a link to the chat. She has some, some in against design thinking podcasts available out there if you want to go. That's awesome. In fact, she said she goes through and, and systematically writes a critique of everything in the Harvard Business Review, so. <laughs> right, and, and gives an alternative. And gives an alternative, so please enjoy. <laughs> I now have to go rethink everything. <laughs> so Carol, I, 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 don't, I don't know if this will be helpful, but you, you, you had me thinking about um, Persig's book, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Yes, yes. And in that great old text, he talked about value being the leading edge of reality. Yeah. And I'm currently working on um, depolarizing our community across yeah. social, political, and religious lines. Yeah. And um, so there's this there's value on the left side of your three columns in terms of our individual preferences, what we choose to do, how we choose to spend, what we choose to consume. And then there's, I think, the more human core value of connectedness and belonging. So how can we work, the work that, what I'm thinking about through your work is how do we work to get below those individualistic values to those deep core values that connect us as human beings? So, so my left-hand side doesn't have anything to do with individual choices. It, it's, well, that's all. I just didn't want to leave you with that thought. And everything that is of value that gets integrated on the right hand side. Oh my gosh, I wish we had more time. Well, forget all that, Daniel. <laughs> go do Let your go wonderful. I mean, you know go, go do your wonderful work in the well, room. And actually, Carol, it just means you're going to have to come back and hang out with us. And the bonus is that every time you come back, you get to wear a different hat. <laughs> and scarf. which i know you are up for that challenge i am you also can come join my communities where we have a couple hundred people doing this kind of work and applying it to change so we might cross cross communities a bit mm. all right so i probably should let you go since we are at the time you wanted to uh sam i'm going to hand it back to you well, let me let me thank you, uh, and let me actually close with just a continuation of what you were inviting us to do, which I've done with this group before, and it just almost always feels like the right way to end, which is to just invite anybody that wants to, to indicate their thanks to you, Carol, for making the time and coming to be with us by offering a short observation about the primary thing that they're 
carrying away. And that may be something in the form of an epiphany. It may be a question that they feel like they can't even begin to imagine how they'll answer. Um, but it's something that you helped spark. This is the Spark series. Okay, we were fine till you did that part. Uh huh. Okay. I'm. I am only an instrument here. I'm. I'm very interested in what they spark for themselves yes if we if we leave it as something i sparked i'm not very interested god bless you so there it is so with that let's just take five minutes and try to get as many voices as we can but just a reminder not in like a speed contest like because we're doing it kind of quaker meeting style so if somebody says something give it a beat to hear what they say and let's end with a better sense of what everybody is carrying away. Go ahead, Pam, and you don't have to raise your hand, just hop in. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Kiara, Carol, uh, first of all, thank you very much for your talk. Um, uh, what your talk inspired in me and reminded me of, me of is the, the sort of the model of the human learning that I like the best, which is, um, Human beings learn best when they focus directly at something like a billiard ball, but uh, they learn uh, when uh, the it becomes like your second quantum paradigm, which is the you diffuse diffuse thinking, which you let go, and just let you let your brain do the processing. Is which when the learning actual learning is done through imagination. So it's pretty much really similar to that. And uh, I say this because I, I try to always see similar things between different ideas rather than see different things. But I very much enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm thinking about regeneration and a lot of reflecting. One thing I feel grateful for is that it's so um, uh, like to say that we can learn to think differently or, you know, evolve and grow in the way we're conceiving of life and what's possible is so freeing in some ways because there's no, it's not like, oh, we have to wait for a certain group to die off because they're never going to learn. Like we can let go of that. You know? Everybody has access to it. And no matter how old they are and in different ways are going to experience it in their life. And it's amazing to think what it would be like for kids who grew up with folks around them who were really consciously intentionally on that, in that conversation. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm, one of the things that uh, became a strong thought because of this conversation. I, I said in the chat, the spark in me affirmed the stripping away and letting go and letting things in and letting things out. And something that came to me and it, it reinforced it, something that came to me a couple of days ago um, was something about the wisdom and simplicity on both sides of complexity. There's something really very simple in all of this that just rings true. Thank you. I'm thinking about the sacred honor it is to have children in my life and how children are whole environments themselves and how best to invite myself to, to work toward not polluting those environments and seeding the conditions in, in um, holding children compassionately as they learn. Uh, I really... No, you go, Daniel. Thanks, Dan. 
Um, Carol, you really um, initiated an important inner dialogue about the distinction between essence and purpose. So I appreciate that. <laughs> I appreciate how um, I'm really tired right now. Just, I have a puppy at home. I'm not sleeping. I'm like on the road. And so my energy coming in to tonight was low. And what I'm so grateful for is I always leave these meetings and space with you all and I feel um, rejuvenated. I never feel drained. I feel buoyed. So thank you all. We've got about one minute left. A simple thing for me, uh, Sam, is I, I think um, it feels great to be validated and to, to feel like I'm on the right track. So thank you to everyone for doing that. Somebody is going to get the last word. I don't know who it is. <laughs> well, I could say thank you very much for your patience and uh, intensity and connection. So thank you so much for letting me come play for an hour. You are so <laughs> welcome. Uh, hope you will come back, everybody. Thanks to Carol and as always to one another. A lot of okay. things you could be doing wherever you are. You have to intentionally carve out space to do this. And I'm grateful, and I know I speak for everybody else, that all of you uh, continue to make that space. We're here every Wednesday night. There's always cool stuff happening. So I look forward to seeing you all down the road. Have a lovely evening. And again, Carol, thank you so much. My pleasure. Bye. 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 Bye.